All right, everybody, we have a great video for the Coronary Calcium channel today. We're joined by our fantastic moderator, Arvind Narula, at his gorgeous apartment in downtown New Mexico there. <laughs> and then we've got C.B. Thomas. C.B. is an interventional and structural cardiologist in Dallas at Baylor, uh, the Heart Hospital Baylor. It's a physician-owned hospital. C.B., I've told him he has one of the greatest jobs in the world. Um, I met C.B. at the uh, the Shockwave KL trip. We, we hit it off, and um, he's got a great case to share with us today, and I think this is a case we can all relate to. This is this is the approach to the nasty calcified osteal cirque. I think this is like the cirque is the bane of our existence, and the osteal cirque is the worst. So, CB, welcome, Arvin, welcome. Thanks for uh, for joining us. Let's let's talk about this case. We had a hard team discussion, and we decided that uh, this is not a straightforward candidate. We're not going to offer her a TAVR. So, what we usually do in these difficult patients is we offer them a BAB, um, and as a bridge to decision. Um, this is her echo showing uh, she had a velocity of 4.1 a mean gradient of 44, and uh, fortunately, her ejection fraction was preserved at 60%. All right, so you're set up, you got your pacer, you're across the valve. Yep, so uh, we got groin access for, a, uh, I planned on, my goal here was not to, you know, get a perfect BAB. My goal here is to take her from severe aortic stenosis to at least moderate. So. Um, I planned on using a tie shack balloon, which is a more of a compliant uh, balloon. So groin access. Um, I think I used a seven French sheath pigtail crossing. Then I'll show you, uh, I used a 20, 20 millimeter tie shack balloon over a safari wire. Uh, the first one kind of slipped, not, not an adequate BAB. Uh, we did again with rapid pacing in the RV. And that, that's a very adequate result. So this is the angiogram. Yikes. All right. Your... Arvin, what, what's your approach here? I know you kind of so already... One, one, I'm glad he did the BAV first. <laughs> I'm glad he yeah, did. Now you see why we had to do the BAV before we tackled something yeah, like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really totally. glad. But, uh, you know, looking at this, just even without uh, contrast, it, you see so much calcification, dialysis patient, you see calcium everywhere in, in this patient's body. I mean, you know, uh, up front, I'm thinking, uh, you know, it's going to be probably rota up front and then shockwave on the backside just to kind of touch up everything, especially that osteal cirque that, that's been troublesome my whole life. Yeah. And I think the other thing with these osteal cirques, like the most important thing is understand the pain that you're about to go through and try to prospectively do everything you can to mitigate that. And that includes delivery, right? So I think CB's groin, you know, I think honestly, this is a case I would think about going groin if I was radial, because you're going to need that support and then, you know, have the guideliner out ready to go have a wiggle wire. So I think that's totally, totally, this is a great case to discuss because I hate these. These are one of my least favorite cases. That's probably the most efficient way to do it too. Just kind of mentally be prepared that, you know, you're going to use a lot of different devices up front, but then that way you're not wasting balloons and wasting steps. So yeah. CB, take us through your thought process. So uh, like you mentioned earlier, if I didn't have to do uh, BAV, I probably would have approached this radially. Uh, we have a six, seven French slender sheath, and I think that would have been more than adequate. But, you know, we're doing a BAV, like you said, better support through the groin, a very high risk calcified lesion. Um, so what we did was uh, my first thought is, what am I going to get through this tight lesion? You know, it's a 90 degree angle. Um, I got to get a wire wire cross. So I don't have it saved, but I was uh, not even able to pass a uh, workhorse wire. Uh, I put the workhorse wire just up to the ostium to wedge a uh, support catheter, turnpike LP. Then I free wired it um, and call it luck or uh, not. Uh, I was <laughs> able to get the uh, floppy, wrote a floppy wire down distally. Oh wow! So you free wired the rota the rota floppy through the microcatheter. Yeah, yeah. Only after I had the microcatheter wedged into that lesion. I love that. I, was able to pass I love it. that. Um, That's like the uncrossable lesion algorithm that yeah. Lombardi and Rob Riley talk about. You know, very, very, very calcified. Basically, a subtotally occluded. But wire went through. Um, I can take a deep breath now. Now rest is you know don't lose wire and get to work. Uh, <laughs> 
what I did was a 1.75 burr based on the vessel size, um, as you can see. Um, taking small pecs at that um, heavy calcified lesion. I wouldn't go any smaller. I mean, 1.5 would have been fine, but definitely not 1.25. I don't want my water bird to jump and get stuck, uh, then make a more complex case even more uh, of a nightmare. So 1.75 burr. Um, let's see if I show one that actually passes. There we go. We're getting around that bend. Now we finally crossed. That's some good pecking motion, CBL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done your rota. Now, at this point, are you going to go up front with Shockwave or are you going to see how NC balloons behave? What's your strategy? So, I mean, we can tell that without even passing an IVIS that this is a heavily calcified lesion. Um, so, again, am I trying to get a perfect picture or am I trying to avoid any kind of complication here in this lady. I think I'm trying to reach that fine medium. So what I did next was I did um, put an IVIS, mainly it's to size the vessel. So I know uh, to answer your question, I did opt to do a shockwave. So this is mainly to see what size shockwave balloon I should use, uh, right. the IVIS. So let's take a look at the IVIS because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm using IVIS on every case now, but by no means am I an expert. So I'm always looking to learn how experts like you are evaluating these. All right, so CB, so you've got this concentric calcium on your vessel. How do you size? I, I have a, I have a little bit of trouble sizing vessels when the calcium is like intimal like this, and like you're supposed to go media to media. So Arvin, CB, how do you how do you guys size these super calcified vessels in terms of where you're measuring from? Yeah, I, I'm going kind of media to media as well, but I'm being more conservative. Um, my goal here is not to be uh, trying to overextend to the true vessel size. I'm trying to break the calcium ring. So I oversize it a little bit beyond the uh, intimal calcium, which takes me a little bit into the media. So you have apposition essentially is what you're saying. Exactly. How about you, Arvin? How do you size these? I, I'm kind of just going a little bit, a little bit bigger, like around one to one vessel size, media to media. If I'll estimate it, but if I do feel like I'm a little bit bigger than I I want to be, I'll I'll go two two atmospheres on the balloon. Okay. And from the distal reference is what you're talking about. Correct. Yeah. All right. So concentric calcium. So at this point, if we use the rule of fives. Right. So um, let's refresh our memory on the rules of fives. I don't, so it's five millimeters, you know, five millimeters wide, right? Of length, yeah. What's the other five? five? 4.5 millimeter thickness. Okay. And then 50% calcium arc. Got it. Yes. Okay. Rule of fives. Got it. So, so uh, this is what it looks like after my rota run. Uh, very, very happy with uh, how this has opened up and made, um, you know, now I can start delivering things. I don't know if I'm ready to deliver a Shockwave 3.5, but at least uh, I have a passage now uh, to deliver my equipment. So this is a good rotor result, but look at that. It doesn't look like the job's done with that calcium modification because that's always where we have trouble with ISR in these circs. Right. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Almost like a boulder of calcium. Yeah, sitting it's, right it's, right well, I feel like the rota just doesn't completely do the job, but it, it allowed you to make a channel for sure. Right. And, and CB, going back to your IVIS, you know, these osteal cirques, you know, in my experience, you almost always have to go into the left main. What are you thinking at this point in terms of where you're going to land the stent? Assuming the IVIS doesn't show severe just a left main disease, like, because I think that's an important point. Right. As long as there is a healthy left main, um, I try not to land it uh, right at the ostium because uh, I've learned from experience that they always come back with um, instant restenosis or it, it plaque shifts into the LAD and now I'm having to intervene LAD a year later. So yeah. I, my, my goal is to always pull it back into the uh, left main if the left main is healthy. Marvin, is that your... Yeah, I've been doing that too, because trying to wire struts, uh, you know, getting in the, the opposite vessel, and then, you know, just think about how much metal's in that area. It's, yeah, I've just been kind of standing into the left main, good imaging, get a huge MSA. Yep. Extra 12 RVUs, baby. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so back to the case. So you've got your rota, you've ibised it. There's still some osteal calcium. What's your next move? Next move is uh, dilate with a uh, because I, I don't think I can pass a shockwave balloon just yet because um, I just don't think there's room to pass. I mean that is one thing. If you ask everyone that uses a shockwave, what can be better? Uh, we want to be able to deliver it better. That's the first answer we get from everybody. So. Um, I decided I'm going to just start ballooning uh, with a non-compliant balloon. As you can see, I'm not trying to focus on the ostium, which which would be more than enough for this um, lady. But uh, as you can see, there's a much distal lesion too, or in the mid left circumflex, there is another tight lesion. Uh, if I don't fix that now, uh, for me to go through the stent and eventually fix it later uh, might make my uh, job a little bit more difficult. So I decided I'm going to take care of that lesion as well. So um, I am doing a uh, NC balloon, 3.0 NC balloon, high pressure, uh, just working my way up, even through the osteum. And I totally agree. I mean, I think you are fooling yourself if you think you're going to deliver shockwave through a calcified osteal cirque that's, that's kind of 90 degrees like this. So I think that at this point, the purpose of ballooning is to facilitate guideliner delivery to get the, the shock wave down there or to get the stent down there, you know? Yeah. Anything else, uh, Arvin, uh, in same approach or? I, I think so. And, and kind of my mentality is fourth and one, get all the pieces that you want in. Um, you know, <laughs> guideliner up front, wiggle up front. I think this is definitely that case. Don't waste time, you know, spend, spend a little bit of time, you know, take a time out, get your play and then and get all the right pieces in place for, for delivery. All right, fourth and one, the Tush Push Eagles have uh, spoken. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, so we can't wait for football season, man. I that's can't right. wait. We're, we're just tush pushing through this, uh, making room, and uh, eventually I do get to the shockwave, um, which I'll kind of find it. And did you lay the shockwave into the left main too, CB? Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, I have to review it. I think I pulled it back a little bit because distal left main did have some calcium too, uh, but I'm not pulling it all the way into the healthy segment. Um, as, as we know, the shock waves, two emitters are more distal. So that's what I'm focusing on, laying into that calcium uh, beyond the circ. Arvin, what do you call it? The shock wave slide? What's the... What's the... Yeah, yeah, the the shock just slide it back a, a, a millimeter by millimeter, right? Just to shock really use those emitters, yeah. So uh, this is me shock uh, shocking right at the ostium. So we we shocked it, and we have the C two plus app. So um, no no shocks left behind. I shocked the whole <laughs> thing. Um, didn't waste any shock. And, and most important, how, how many how many shocks do you guys give, and do you guys de air? in between shocks. Arvin? I, I think for, for those eccentric lesions, I'm, I'm leaning on it a little more, you know, even in the same location, especially like that osteal cirque, like you described, right? Yeah. It's just, I, I'll be, I'll probably pulse there in the same location a few more than normal, like 30, 40 shocks in the same spot up and down and then move it back a little bit back and forth. But, you know, I, I'd want to use it. It always makes me question, is 120 enough? Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you just want yeah. to keep going. I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm in the same can. I don't leave any beer in the can. I, I, I drink all the beer and then I do the 120 shocks. And, um, and you know, the de airing thing's a good point, CB. We talked about that at, at, at the Shockwave headquarters. You know, I didn't realize that one of the reasons you can only do 10 shocks at a time is when you come down, you need to let the vapor come out of the balloon. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been reprepping it. I haven't seen a huge issue, although sometimes you can see some bubbles in it. Are you guys routinely reprepping it during the course of the 120 pulses? Not, not routinely. Yeah, I, I was until we went to the headquarters and kind of got better insight from the engineers. So what my practice now is I obviously start distal, you know, these balloons, if you don't start distal, it's not going forward, right? So start distal wherever you want to shock, then especially left main, you know, when I'm shocking that area, I am occluding LAD, I'm occluding uh, left circ, uh, but the saving grace of this uh, patient is the fact that we BAV and her EF is normal. You know, if this was a cardiomyopathy patient, EF 20%, that, 
they're going to crash if we keep shocking the left main like this. Yeah. So I started this still in my rule of thumb right now, there's no right or wrong after about 40 pulses, meaning 10 pulse, I, you know, take the balloon down, give the uh, patient some chance to recover, uh, let the blood flow go through, give another 10. So once I get to 40, I'm pulling negative, re-prepping the balloon. I don't take it out of the body, but I am de-airing it twice because these shockwave balloons, if there are bubbles in there, the therapy is not as effective because the air bubbles in the shockwave affects the sonic wave that are dispersed. So I started doing that routinely after 40 pulses. I am pulling back negative twice. I like that. And it doesn't really add that much time. I think right. it gives a patient a breather. Uh, exactly. So here's, here's, so after shocking, this is the picture. Um, we have, uh, this is after several high pressure balloons and shock. Looks pretty good. This is, this is, this is the best, uh, therapy 2024 can offer today. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, good thing is that there's no uh, flow limiting dissection. She has timing three flow. Things are moving along as planned. Uh, again, my, uh, thing that makes it more challenging is this almost 90 degree turn uh, to deliver. Now I can start delivering stents down there to that mid lesion. And I've been burned on this. I don't know if you guys have had the same experience. When you're delivering stents into a, a, a calcified tortuous circ, you better fucking get that stent there because if you don't and you try to pull it out, it's going to stay. And then you're going to have this underexpanded. I've had that happen in my first couple months of practice and I've never done it again. So now Anytime I'm delivering a stent into a torturous calcified circ, I have a guideliner because I just can't. Yeah. Be have you guys had that experience? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you never had that, Arvin? Oh, God. It's horrible. Now I know about it. It's going to happen. <laughs> uh -huh. Because, you know, you push it into the calcium, right? And so yeah. the momentum of the stent's going forward. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, the stent is, is caked inside the calcium. And when you pull it back, the balloon comes, but the stent stays in the calcium. And then it's really bad time. So I had that happen at, you know, my first job at Kaiser and I've never done it again now. So. So one thing I, I'm kind of shocked by as I'm doing this case uh, that I'm shocked I didn't do while I'm delivering these stents. Can you, can you tell what I'm shocked by? What I forgot to do here? Use Which the guideliner? Is, what's that? Use the guideliner? Or? No, God, God, I did have to use oh. the guideliner eventually, but I'm just surprised. LED. Yeah, LED. LED. Oh, why are the LED? Why are the LED? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, eventually, I do for the kissing at the end, but mm -hmm. just reviewing this case right now, I'm like, why didn't I put a wire down the LED? That is such a good point. I mean, that's, that's, I, I, I think everyone's learned that the hard way, but. Whenever yeah. you're doing an osteal LED or circ, wire the other yeah, vessel. Joe, uh, Joe just tells me, just put a wire down. It takes two seconds. Yes. <laughs> I, I, just looking at this, I'm like, uh, look at the way my guide is digging into the left main. Um, you I did should... have a guide liner though, CB, so maybe that's why. You know, because it's hard. If you well, have a second it, wire, you can do it. But... Yeah, initially, if uh, uh, the rota, that's one reason I didn't put a wire down. When yeah. I the rota, I didn't put a wire down the LED. But when I do have uh, two wires, uh, what I do is I don't put the guideliner through both wires. Yeah. Uh, let's say I'm working on the circ. I would wire the LED, leave that wire there. Then I would put the guideliner or a telescope through the circ only. That and way, you get any interaction with the wire with that? I have not. If the if the guide is big enough, what about you guys? I have not. I have not that that issue. I don't yeah. routinely do that, but Chris Brown does. I don't know, Arvin, do you? No, I've not, I've not been. I've just put it over both wires. Yeah, and, and the only reason I do that, especially for this case, is if I bring the guideliner and I have a wire in the LAD and the circ, I'm not getting past that turn. Yeah, you can't get. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm limited to bringing the guideliner right to the bifurcation. But yeah. as you'll see, after I delivered this dent, um, I I know I used the guideliner. As you can see, it's sitting there. Uh, I delivered this dent, I deployed it, but as you'll see, I'm trying to deliver the next dent was near impossible. So deploying that distal stent here, uh, good expansion, a little bit underexpanded in the middle. But as you can see, I have my guideliner shoved all the way into that distal stent. 
then I'm bringing my osteo to left main stand, then I, my plan is I'm going to unsheath at this point. Any comments, anything you guys would do differently? No, not that's, that's, I think, I think like, getting it into the stent is critical. And so did you use torpedo that in there with a, with like a three O balloon or something like that or two O balloon? Yeah. I, I usually anchor it. If I can't get it, um, I, I don't have it saved. I usually inflate a balloon here, anchor it or kind of balloon track it. Uh, a lot of times if there's a stent, I'm inflating uh, a balloon and holding it, anchoring it down. Then I pull the guideliner or telescope through the bend. And that's what I had to do for this case. Got it. The next important thing is, that, you know, I, I use what's called a stent boost to really make sure I nail down this uh, overlap, minimal overlap as possible, but enough to, you know, I, I need at least six millimeter into the left main uh, to eventually pot. So that's kind of what I'm working on here, um, looking at stent boost to find the right overlap here. As you can see, I have very minimal overlap between these two stents. That's a good point, man. I never thought about that. Having at least six millimeters in the left main so you can take a small balloon to pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, I at least try to do six millimeter. And as you can see here, I, I don't, I, I break that rule. I, I don't think I'm six millimeter. Uh, yeah, close enough. Yeah, close enough. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very meticulous at this point to make sure I really nail down the osteum. I have enough into the left main. That's kind of what I'm doing here. And finally, we're deploying the stent. Oh, great expansion. Expansion, yeah. good, yeah. Yeah, this is this is the expansion. Um, yeah. You can see a little bit of waste here, but again, we're not going for perfection in this uh, particular patient. So uh, and then I obviously go back in with um, IBIS. Um, let me ask you guys this. Uh, after Shockwave, do you... Do you go back in with the IVIS or uh, OCT to confirm you have? I kind of use the balloon to help guide me. Like if, if there's some under expansion, I'm not sure about something, uh, you know, but if the balloon is expanded, you know, even if I'm going to two or four atmospheres, that kind of gives me a lot of comfort or my NC balloon is fully expanding. It gives me a lot of comfort that, okay, the, the job's done. Yeah. yeah, I do the NC balloon after shockwave just to make sure. And then I do two, I kind of look at it in two views to make sure it's not eccentrically underexpanded. Um, I try to IVIS before and after. I try not to do any inter procedure IVIS unless Watch, I. Have can you describe that? How you, you look at the two views? What do you see? So, like if I'm like in doing an LED, like a mid LED, I'll, I'll, I'll shockwave with like, let's say a 3 5 balloon. Then I'll take a 3.5 NC in just to confirm. And I think maybe if you fracture the calcium, that'll help the calcium expand a little bit. I don't know. And then um, I'll, I'll go in like an REO cranial view, and then I'll just flip to like a, a, a AP caudal view just to make sure that if the balloon's eccentrically underexpanded that I can see it. Because I've been burned before with that. So um, so that's what I do. Got it. I, I like that. I'm going to start doing them. Two it's views. quicker than Ivis sometimes. <laughs> So I love this. So you're ivising post? Yeah, post ivising. Make sure we have good apposition, good stent expansion. Um, and routinely I do after shockwave, I go in with an ivis just to make sure I have some fractures. So it's not, I haven't undersized the shockwave and, um, you know, get stuck with an underexpanded stent. So, uh, but again, in this lady, I've said it several times, less is more. So uh, in this particular patient, I didn't go back in, but because I know we're well opposed when we are shocking um this tight tight lesion here this is uh going back in with an nc balloon and we're optimizing that under expanded area at this point i'm using a four five uh, nc balloon here uh, just to uh, kind of recap the distal stent is a 4.0 stent and the proximal stent into the left main is a four five stent yeah i like the use of collimation too. save yourself some Lymphoma. Save some radiation. So I finally, uh, you know, thought of protecting the LAD here. Then what I'm doing is I'm undersizing. What, what do you guys do here? Um, kiss, don't kiss, just leave it as provisional. You, you know what I'd be interested in? The drug coated balloon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious how, how people... jailbreak drug coated balloon for jailbreak. <laughs> I love that, dude. Yeah, I always jailbreak if it's a, you know, if it's like a, sh a shitty little circumflex, I usually won't, but 
if it's a if it's an LED, I'll definitely jailbreak it with an undersized kind of compliant balloon. Like if it's a three five S, I'll take like a three O, and I'll, I'll usually either kiss or just jailbreak it. Yeah, and, and that's what I did. I know that LED is bigger than a 3.0 vessel. I took a 3.0 balloon. Mm -hmm. um, all I'm trying to do is open up the strut. I'm not trying to disrupt the you know, LED uh, media or intima uh, over the osteo. So I just want to open up the strut and uh, I do the thin balloon. And eventually I go back and pot the left main. And this is why it's so important you leave at least um, eight millimeter, six to eight millimeter, your smallest balloon uh, to pot that. And I'm, I'm again, fine tuning it to make sure I'm staying within the stent and not ballooning the left main. And we have stent boost, which just shows clearly that my uh, end marker is within the stent and I'm potting it. It also looks like that osteal cirque got really good expansion. Yep. So I agree. And that, oh, look at that. We were dying in suspense. That looks uh, amazing. <laughs> that's final picture. Um, I know there's a little bit of a plaque shift or a plaque in that osteal LED, but we're leaving that alone. We like the Timmy 3 flow. Uh, Timmy 3 flow into the cirque. We're happy she got a BAB. Uh, we, we achieved... Um, our goal at this point. All right. Well, that was a great case. Thank you so much, CB. Really appreciate it. Hope to have you on again. Arvin, uh, any closing thoughts from our, our coronary calcium moderator? No, it's a tough case, but just be prepared. Yep. Yeah. Prepared. Be Boys, thanks, Arvin, for having me. Love it.